Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. On April 6, 1846, the Dred Scott case first went to trial in St. Louis, Missouri's old courthouse. The case involved an enslaved couple, Dred and Harriet Scott, who filed suit against their owner to gain their freedom. They did this based on the fact that they had once lived in free territory and should therefore have been emancipated based on the doctrine of once free, always free, previously recognized by Missouri's courts. Little did the Scots know that 11 years and several court cases later, the question of their freedom would be brought before the U.S. Supreme Court and would result in the horrendous Dred Scott decision. That decision would serve as a major catalyst for the turbulent events leading up to the American Civil War. In this episode of Your History, Your Story, our guest is Lynn Jackson, the great-great-granddaughter of Dred and Harriet Scott and the president and founder of the Dred Scott Heritage Foundation. Lynn will be sharing the fascinating story of her courageous ancestors who persevered in their pursuit of freedom. I'd now like to welcome Lynn Jackson to our show. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure to be with you. I've heard good things about your program. Happy to be on it. (laughs) Well, we're really happy to have you. This is such an important topic in history, and I can't wait to hear this story roll out. So I'd like to start off by asking you, Where were you born and raised, Lynn? I was actually born in St. Louis, Missouri. I was raised here and I've lived here my whole life. And even though we've had opportunities to move away through jobs and they were great opportunities, but they always seem to settle here. So um, this is home. Ah, yes. And it's like me with New Jersey. People say stuff about New Jersey. I'm like, you know, it's my home. I love this place. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing's really as bad as it seems. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. I want to first ask you, when did you first become aware of your uh, relation to Dred and Harriet Scott? That would have been when I was a very little girl. I remember vividly a night at the old courthouse with lots of lights and a huge crowd of people. It was just overflowing actually, as I remember. And I barely came up to the staircase. They had this big staircase thing. And I I wasn't even tall as all of that, but they were reenacting the Dred Scott decision and my dad played Dred Scott. So waiting for him to speak, he never did. And that seemed really weird to me because my dad was a great speaker and it's like, he never said anything. But I remember that night vividly. And it turned out that it also was in Ebony Magazine. So that was my first vivid remembrance of him, knowing that somebody very important was a part of our family. So your, your dad didn't have to worry about memorizing any lines or anything? No, but he didn't need to. He's a great orator. <laughs> yeah. So tell us about who Dred and Harriet Scott were and the important role that they played in American history, Lynn? Well, Dred and Harry both were born in Virginia, although they didn't know each other there. They actually met and married at Fort Snelling in the Wisconsin territories back then, which is now St. Paul, Minneapolis area. And Fort Snelling was um, a major place. Uh, Dred was owned by Dr. John Emerson. She was owned by Major Lawrence Tolliver, an Indian agent and a justice of the peace. So their marriage actually was sealed with a wedding, which is an unusual thing. Um, The wedding and and them being married also played a role in them being able to prove that they had been freed. Mm -hmm. But that's a long story. And yet uh, they ended up in St. Louis. Dr. Emerson dies and his widow owns them. She would not give them their freedom. And so on April the 6th of 1846, they felt they had no choice but to go to the old courthouse and file for the freedom that they had. The freedom they had based on a rule that said if you were ever in free territory, which Fort Snelling was, as well as Illinois where Dred had lived, that you were always free. But Mrs. Emerson wouldn't give them that freedom. So as a backdrop to April 6, 1846, filing to prove 
and, and request their freedom to the courts. It took 11 years and five trial proceedings for them to find out from the US Supreme Court that they had no rights, that whites were bound to respect, and that not only they, but all of people of African descent were not considered citizens, and therefore they would never be free. They had no rights. It was an incredible decision that actually went further. It brought in the Missouri Compromise and threw it out and throughout the Northwest Ordinance and allowed slavery to be from coast to coast, as it were. And this was just an incredible, if you will, gasoline on the fire because uh, the North and the South really went at it. And a very important thing uh, that I found in my research was the secession papers, which shows all the newspaper articles of how it was responded to the North and the South, very interesting. But the case itself um, on March 6th of 1857 was that worst decision of the Supreme Court has been deemed many times called that, that this decision was a major catalyst to the Civil War, which was already kind of brewing in the background, but this just really just socked it. And so there was the war and there was freedom. And after that came the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments within a year and a half. And they're also called the Dred Scott Amendments at times because it all came out of Dred Scott and the 13th abolished slavery. The 14th gave citizenship to former slaves mm -hmm. and the 15th gave black men the right to vote. So the impact of the case, it was very clear that the nation was torn asunder for sure. And we all know that the South seceded and Lincoln became president, by the way, he was getting ready to get out of politics, but the case decision just turned him around. And he became our 16th president that uh, got us through that terrible time. So the Dred Scott decision from what I've read is was a major issue with Lincoln when he ran for president. This is something mm -hmm. that was an important thing. And then when he was elected, the Southern states uh, felt that oh boy, we're going to be losing our rights now. And um, that created more friction between the North and the South at that point. Oh, absolutely. And on the other hand, if Lincoln had lost and the Southern candidate had won, there may not have been a civil war and slavery may not have ended till who knows when. So who knows when. Now, you said the first uh, lawsuit was filed by Dred Scott in 1846, but the Supreme Court decision wasn't made until 1857. That's 11 years mm -hmm. that Dred and Harriet Scott persisted seeking their freedom. That's amazing. It is, and, and that's the backdrop of the story that people don't always hear. Uh, this family with two daughters and they lost two sons, but the family itself went through this ordeal for a long time. And um, they made a lot of personal sacrifices. And I always uh, draw attention to the fact that they could have easily stopped after six years when the Missouri Supreme Court denied them their freedom after having had a, a history and a pattern of precedence of giving freedom to slaves who were in this situation. And so surely by going to the Missouri Supreme Court, they'll fix this, but no, they did not. And by the way, they did get their freedom once by a jury of 12 white men, but immediately Mrs. Emerson overturned, I mean, appealed it. And so that's how it ended up going to the Missouri Supreme Court and on and on it went. But yeah, the, just thinking about their personal lives and what they had to go through. Um, and I won't have time to go through all of that here, but it, it was outstanding to me. And again, I say they could have stopped in 1852, but they didn't. And that's the thing that impresses me the most. Yeah, I'm just thinking, how was it that it got to the level of the Supreme Court of the United States? Roswell Field found the diversity clause. Um, specifically, the diversity clause is that if you are going to sue someone in another state, then you can take your case to a federal level. And Dred and Harriet had sued Mrs. Emerson, but she left her business to her, her brother, John Sanford, who lived in New York. And so she went off to seek her fortunes, find a new husband, but her brother's name is on the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott beats John Sanford. So um, that is how it got to the Supreme Court because it got to the federal level. And it was pursued by Roswell. 
And it was argued by Montgomery Blair, who was the attorney in Washington, DC. The Scots and Roswell Field were in St. Louis. And you'll sometimes see people in showing that Dred and Harriet were on the steps of the Missouri Supreme Court. They really weren't. In spirit, they were there hoping for their freedom, but in physicality, they were here in St. Louis. Yeah, but when you mentioned the worst Supreme Court decision ever, it was horrendous when you think of what they were actually saying that people of African descent were not citizens and therefore could not go to the Supreme Court because they didn't have any rights as citizens. And from what I've read about it is that Chief Justice Tawney, I think his name was, correct? He was Roger the Chief Tawney. Mm -hmm. There was some interpretation done of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence that the intent of the founding fathers was mm -hmm. to exclude Black people mm -hmm. from the liberties that are stated in those documents. Yeah, that's true. He said that they are not, nor were they ever intended to be considered citizens, which actually was just not altogether true. And uh, for those who do like to do research, I would tell you to go out and look at Thomas Jefferson's many drafts of the Declaration of Independence, wherein he spoke you know, terribly of slavery and also of King George. And so there's more to that than the Messiah, the, the what version we have is less powerful than what Jefferson wanted it to be in the language. But all of that um, shows us that there were founding fathers who were trying to get rid of slavery. But ultimately the decision was to keep the union together. Then we'll have to hopefully work on this so that it will gradually go away. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they accepted it the way they did. But you know, clearly there were some who were very happy with leaving it as status quo. So there was always division. Yeah, and I also understand that there weren't any real citations from either the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution that specifically backed up what the uh, Supreme Court finding that uh, Chief mm -hmm. Justice Tawney had made these statements, but there were mm -hmm. there was a lack of citations actually to back up his finding. That's why we refer to them as activist judges, and they still do these things today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Now, Lynn, what happened after the mm -hmm. Dred Scott decision in 1857? What happened to Dred and Harriet after that? Well, the good news is that before the decision, there was um, there was a situation with Ms. Emerson where she married a man who was a congressman, a dentist. Oh, and by the way, he was an abolitionist. Mm -mm. And he was very, very firm about his position against slavery. She did not tell him she owned any slaves, let alone Dred Scott. And when he found out by reading the newspaper in Boston, he was mortified. I would think so. I would think so. And just imagining the conversation they may have had, but it was within his heart and soul to not be a slave owner. And because his wife owned slaves, he owned slaves. It was very hard on him, but he, he went right to work writing letters between himself, Roswell Field, and Montgomery Blair on a plan to get the Scots their freedom and get him out of slavery holding. And uh, I have letters of their correspondence have copies of all the letters that they wrote to correspond as to how they would deal with this. And the ultimate plan was that um, they would let uh, Taylor Blow, Taylor Blow, who was one of the original owner's children, and then we should speak of them soon, but that Taylor Blow would buy this Red Scott family for $1. And with the express purpose of freeing him, he did just that on May 26th of 1857. So you see that within three months of the Dred Scott decision, the Dred Scott family actually got their freedom from one of the sons of their original owner. Oh, wow. Praise God for that. That is wonderful that they Absolutely. had that experience. Now, mm -hmm. uh, how long, I, I understand that Dred Scott passed away not long after getting his freedom. How long did he actually have his freedom mm -hmm. for? Well, I like to answer that question because I see all kinds of things on the internet. You know, he died shortly thereafter. He died in nine months, but he did die shortly. Yeah. But it was 18 months, approximately 18 months or a year and a half 
he lived as a free man, but he did die of tuberculosis or consumption, they called it. And he's, he was buried at West End Cemetery in St. Louis, which doesn't exist anymore, but it is on property owned by St. Louis University. So um, he was moved again uh, by the same gentleman that freed him, Taylor Blow, moved to Calvary Cemetery. And that's where he lies now. He was there 90 years unmarked. And in 1857, on the 100th anniversary, uh, there I go again, 1957, mm -hmm. on the 100th anniversary, uh, there was a headstone purchased for him by the granddaughter of one of the owner's sons. So uh, the Blow family has stayed involved throughout the, the decades. Uh, and I work with them, actually, uh, some of their descendants as part of a program I have. And they're fabulous people. They really are. So uh, it's really amazing how different this generation is from the generations that were before. But the Blow family always seemed to have that, that special heart and spirit. Even when they owned slaves, they treated them more like family and friends. Mm -hmm. And um, Dred Scott is a great example of that, which is not the norm. You don't hear that all the time. But they helped him with his case by finding people to help pay for it. Uh, lawyers to help argue it. They did whatever they could to help support and they stood by him until the very end. In fact, Taylor Blow even paid for three grave plots for him to be buried at Calvary because a black person could not be buried next to a white person. Mm -hmm. And so uh, today we're using that same space to try to embellish his grave site with a monument and hopefully that will happen in the next year or so. Oh, that's good. And I want to talk about that in a little bit, but uh, that's, that's good to, to hear that that's in the in the works. Yeah. Uh, what about Harriet? She she went on to live quite a bit longer, right? She did. Uh, <laughs> our women are hardy, you know. Yeah, Harriet was a laundress. And all of her life, um, you know, she was either cooking, but mostly doing laundry. She was listed in the city directory several times as a laundress even uh, when she was enslaved. And so I like to call her the first business owner, entrepreneur of our family, because when she was freed, then she continued to do her work before herself and could keep all of her money. And so she and her daughters um, lived in St. Louis downtown and uh, she lived 18 more years. She died in 1876. So um, she even outlived one of her daughters, yeah. Really. Now, the, the daughters uh, were also part of when, when, when the Blow family purchased Dredd and Harriet, did they also purchase their... Oh, they purchased their, the family. A whole family. So they the all family. got their freedom. Oh, yeah. Oh, they wouldn't do it without the girls. Absolutely. Yeah. They, they did all of this partly because of the girls as well. They didn't want them to grow up in slavery. And young girls as they were becoming of age. Now, the, ba the younger girl, they're eight years apart. The younger girl was just born when they filed. But after 11 years, you know, she was 11 and the other daughter was 17, almost 18. But it would be um, nothing for someone to come and just purchase the girls and uh, sell them because they were becoming of age to where they could bear children. And this brought in more property for the slave owner. And so there was a phrase called, the girls would be likely to likely to bear children. And so they were looking for those kinds of young ladies and Dred and Harriet were trying to protect their girls from that. And I'm sure that Dred and Harriet were, that's why they were sticking to it and very persistent was right. so that not only would they to get their own freedom, but their daughter's freedom. And what a terrifying thought to think of your, your children being sold out from underneath you. It is absolutely horrifying, horrific. It's totally really unthinkable. You know, you have to press into that thought to, to get it, but it's, a, it's not a good thing at all. Yeah. And yet it happened so much. And we know that story and we know that history, but that's what they were fighting against. And, you know, as the case went along, um, it didn't mean that slavery would be ended, but, but their stance would be made so that other people in their position would be able to get their freedom. And hopefully, ultimately in time that, it would end and you know everyone could have free but it was it was a hard decision they did some special things to protect their family they made some serious sacrifices so i'll talk about that shortly too yeah it it must be 
something to think that an ancestor of yours and, and their persistence and their passion and their courage really um, resulted in a catalyst that brought about the Civil War. And as terrible as the Civil War was, it ultimately ended slavery. Yes. From your standpoint, as mm -hmm. the great, great granddaughter of Dredd and Harriet, to, to think that in your family tree are people who are such a huge part of history of this country. Yeah, you know, um, pretty much we're a humble family, but, <laughs> but you can't ignore the fact that this was monumental. And so uh, it's just really a privilege to be able to, to talk about them and share about them. And everything I've done is because I want people to know about them. I'm a messenger. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, that brings me to my next question. So, you know, there's a lot of people who have great, great grandparents they may have found while researching their family or, or they, they remember somebody mentioning somebody in their family, but just because you're related doesn't mean that you're going to step up and become a leading voice to commemorate and educate people about your great, great grandparents and actually ultimately founding the Dred Scott Heritage Foundation. Tell us how this came about and what is the mission of your foundation? Well, when you, listening to you say it that way, it sounds pretty amazing, but to me, it's, it's kind of a natural, normal thing and I just go about doing it. But in 1995, I clearly felt that God was saying to me, you should research Dred Scott. And I thought out loud, you know, you're right. I should know more than the average person. And I, you'll hear me say this on other interviews because those were my exact words. And that's exactly what happened. I just, in the little free time that I had, I would, you know, research, uh, look at books, uh, get on the internet then. And I began to create volumes of information. I mean, three ring binders, I had at least 17 of them, of things that I printed out that I learned. And I just kind of self-taught myself, not just about them, but everything surrounding the history of slavery, them and, and people. It was fascinating and I absolutely loved it. I had no idea then I was gonna do what I'm doing. But in uh, 2003, there was this dear man, Dave Hewler, who worked at the old courthouse. And he came up to my dad and said, um, oh, you know, the 100th no, 150th anniversary is coming up pretty soon, 2007. We need to get busy, we need to get started. And he said, you need to talk to my daughter. And so he said to me, well, let's get started. Let's plan something. I said, you know what? I think that's a good idea, but it's four years away and I really don't need four years to plan something. I, I, I think I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> but he, he looked at me like, oh, she's not gonna do it. But I kept my word. And he was a delightful, awesome, wonderful friend. And um, one of our founding board members when I did found the Dred Scott Heritage Foundation. So uh, he's no longer with us, but we will never forget him. David Euler with the National Park Service. So um, the mission itself, however, is to commemorate, educate, and have reconciliation. So it's commemoration, education, reconciliation. That's what you'll see on our website. And that's what we do. And they all overlap so much. It's just amazing. I didn't know what reconciliation was supposed to be. I knew about commemorating. That was easy. And we needed a statute. So I, I got a plan here. Education, that's second nature to us. And, and yeah, love it, got it. Oh Lord, what does reconciliation mean? I don't know what to do with that. I have no clue, but I heard him say, these are your words. These are the three words. And I went with it, of course. So little did I know how he would unfold it before my eyes. All I had to do really was step into it. But the mission is, uh, it just took off like a rocket. And the day after the 150th anniversary here in St. Louis, which we had um, over 40 organizations work for a whole year in 2006 to plan a year long commemoration here. It was fabulous. And um, the very next day I was in Washington DC speaking to the National Association of Attorney Generals National Conference. Wow. And it was like, wow. And then a month later I was at Harvard <laughs> and it's like double <laughs> wow. <laughs> And it just took off and things have just been happening ever since. So it has been a good thing. It has. Wow. That is so wonderful. You know, I was a history major in college and I remember taking some classes or 19th century civil war. 
And I remember Dred Scott decision was like a, a half a page uh, in a book. I'm being mm -hmm. honest, this is what it used to be. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, going forward, even though I love history, I, I knew it was a, an important decision. It was sort of one of the catalysts towards the Civil War. But I didn't know the whole background of it. I didn't really you know, dig into the fact that it was an 11 year process that, uh, you know, that the that, that ownership uh, had changed during those times or during the lives of uh, Dredd and Harriet and ultimately how it tied in, the decision tied in with the Missouri compromise being declared unconstitutional mm -hmm. and all those things. And, you know, Abraham Lincoln's uh, passion for, you know, fighting against it and uh, ultimately the Civil War. So I am just so excited to have met you and uh, in preparing for this podcast, I've been really reading up and I've been watching YouTubes and I've been listening to interviews with you and I'm so excited to be able to share this with our Thank listeners. You. Thank well, you. I appreciate so it. Thank you, James. Yes. So what are some of the major successes you feel that you've had through the foundation? Well, I have to say, the, number one is that we created the first ever statue of Dred Scott and Harriet. And it is absolutely stunning. It was uh, created by, I call him master sculptor, Harry Weber from St. Louis area. He's right here in St. Louis, but it was a blind evaluation that he won. We had several sculptors from around the country and Harry just nailed every part of the proposal and uh, people did not know who they were voting for. And yet he, he turned out to be the man. And uh, Harry has often said that this is and always will be the most important piece he will have ever made. And so uh, it stands outside the old courthouse. We raised around $250,000 for the statue. Nice. And we unveiled it on June the 8th of 2012. And it stands on the east side of the courthouse and looks toward the arch. They themselves are looking east and north, both directions for freedom. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's charming, it's wonderful. And it has changed the the whole sense of what the old courthouse is about. You know, there was a time when it was just St. Louis history, but it will always be St. Louis history, but they had not ever given great due enough to the Dred Scott decision. They would mention it. Yeah. But even when I would go there as a child, there was maybe one plaque with his picture on it when you come in. And after that, it was the old courthouse. Now he's going to have his own wing of the courthouse as they are closed for a couple of years for total renovations. And one of those renovations will be a room for Dred and Harriet Scott. Oh, congratulations on that. That is fantastic. I'm so mm -hmm. glad to hear that. We're thrilled. <laughs> we really oh, are. Wow. When you go to visit there, you must get goosebumps, huh? Well, um, it's kind of like my second home. <laughs> when <it's open. laughs> I'm there all lot. And I am you know, pleased to say I'm on the board of the Jefferson National Parks Association. So I um, really get a chance to uh, involve myself with programming there and um, just the people I want. And it's come a long way. I've really seen a lot of changes. Uh, and, and I see even at Fort Snelling, they are renovating right now up there as well. And I'm a part of that exhibit that they're creating uh, because Dred Scott lived there and it's very important. Fort Snelling is almost one of the major foundation stones for his case that he lived in that free territory. But again, they had not played up the history of the slaves or the Native Americans or even the Chinese that were there. And all of this is changing. So I do see uh, some very positive things coming out of the way. Uh, we are starting to share our history, even at the arch, they're more honest about the manifest destiny and uh, things that happened here in Missouri. Right. Now, Fort Snelling, I'm, am I saying that right? Fort Snelling? Yes. Fort mm -hmm. Snelling was in the Wisconsin Territory, which is, I guess, where it is, where it would have been now is modern day Minnesota. St. Paul. Mm -hmm. St. Paul. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Now, what are some of the bigger challenges that you've had, Lynn, in, with your foundation? <laughs> Finding help uh in the sense that we actually don't have a staff <laughs> and okay. it's um you know I, I do a lot of things but i i just 
one challenge for me is I just wish we had more people and, and money that we could pay them, I guess I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. So that is a challenge. Um, uh, it's, it's 24 seven and I love it, but that is one challenge. Uh, a challenge was at, at one point to raise the $250,000, but we did it, we paid it off and uh, you know, all is well there. Uh, another challenge is that we're trying to get a stamp for Dred Scott. And we have the Dred Scott stamp campaign on our website, dredscottlives.org. And yet um, it's out of our hands how that will ever go. We have to do a petition campaign. And so those who do go to our website could download a form, have other people sign it. And I believe you can sign online too, but we really like the form and mail it to us because um, it takes thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of signatures to impress people, but I don't even understand why we need to ask for a Dred Scott stamp. So that's challenging to me. I agree. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I have to ask you this. Have you developed through your research and involvement uh, with the foundation a stronger sense of what your great, great grandparents were like as people? I, I ask that because our podcast is your history, your story, and you're you're giving us some wonderful history, but it, it makes me want to know who these people were even more. Who, who were mm -hmm. Dredd and Harriet? What were they like? Have you gotten any closer to who they were as people? You know, I think that I have, um, but it's only by putting two and two together because there's nothing of theirs that was written by them. It's assumed they did not know how to write, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And also very few words are written from them. In fact, I don't think I have seen any words that Harriet ever, well, that's not true. Harriet did speak some words, but it's in the Frank Leslie Illustrated. And that is a good place where I got a good sense of some of what they were like. Frank Leslie Illustrated was uh, published on June 27th, 1857, after they had gotten their freedom and the whole nation was in an uproar, but they were famous. The case was famous. They, the name Dred Scott was very famous. And so they were on the front page and it was a long, wonderful article written about them. And that article gives a lot of insight. Harriet said um, that she wished that the white man would leave him alone. And Dred indicated that they wanted him to travel the country and he could make a thousand dollars going around the country speaking. And that was a lot of money. So oh, yeah. Harriet didn't want any part of it. She said she earned her money honestly and she doesn't need that. And she didn't want him to go. But she was also very protective of him because, you know, given the fact that, and I believe they were, well, I know they were intelligent. Um, I'll tell you another thing in a moment. But she was very protective of him and she kind of understood and could see what the opportunities would be, but what they could also mean. And what danger might there be to him, you know, on the road and, so no, she was protective, she was outspoken, she was strong. And so I think her personality kind of permeate down through the family because there's that, that strong-willed woman is still here today. And <laughs> Alive and well. Us, a few of us, you know. Yeah, so she was, uh, she's my great-great-grandmother. And then Dred was um, determined, but a little more easygoing, I think. And yet, um, what I love is that in the paper, they say that um, he knew his case and spoke of it as a seasoned litigant. And that speaks volumes. It does. He was not uninvolved. He wasn't just a pawn. He was someone greatly involved in the future of himself and his family. And uh, there's a pamphlet out there, and I wish one day I could find it. It could be in Library of Congress. I just don't know. But the lawyers wrote a pamphlet soliciting help for a lawyer in DC to take his case before they got Montgomery Blair. And I've never seen this document, but there are references to it as well as quotes from it. And in it, Dredd says uh, in his own words, they wrote, you know, is there anyone out there would help a poor soul who needs, you know, help with this case? Those are, that's just me paraphrasing. But in first person, he appeals for someone to help him, not just, hey, we got Dred Scott over here, anybody wanna help him? So he was involved in that pamphlet. He, he spoke for himself. He spoke on behalf of his family. And knowing what this was going to be, he truly was speaking on behalf of his race. Yes, he was. So I think that, uh, again, not afraid to send that out, not backing down from being a part of it. Speaking about his case as a seasoned litigant means he knew everything that was going on. He followed it. He watched it. He talked to those people, the lawyers, his friends. He was there. 
And so um, it, it just makes me feel like, yep, that's my dad. <laughs> my dad went to Lincoln University Law School, graduated from there, and Harris Stowe Teachers College graduated from there. My uncle, Dred Scott Madison, was one of the first Black detectives in Grand Rapids, Michigan. My oh. aunt Rosie was uh, just a leader and a lifelong um, employee in the government. And so these are people who grew up in the 20s, you know, and 30s, maybe even a couple of them might have been 18, 16, 18, 19, I'm sorry, 19, 16, 19, 18. So I'm, I'm talking back in time, almost 100 years ago, they were born, some of them. And yet they were very successful because they had it in them that they could do it. You know, didn't matter. Oh, Dred Scott was my great grandfather. Oh my God, we're slaves. Oh, I just, I can't do anything. Baloney. No, we all can do everything we choose to do and determine to do. And they did. And so I think that strong willness just has, was a part of them. As you indicated, they, they went through the 11 years. I, I'm saying they could have quit. They didn't. And we're not quitters. So I think oh. that... Um, very much uh, a, a good part of them has been passed down to several, several, several of the family members. Oh, that is so good. That is so good. You know, I couldn't help but think of this while I was reading up on the Dred Scott story. So 11 years of litigation, in effect, uh, suing their, uh, quote, owners, unquote. Isn't that kind of an uncomfortable situation to be in for 11 years? Is your terribly you're... uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. And the longer it went and the further up the court system it went, the more uncomfortable it was. Mm. Um, technically, it could be looked at as sedition for a slave to sue their owner. Mm. And that is a serious charge. There also was the fact that in his case, um, you know, God was with them because the sheriffs here in St. Louis, they were given over to the sheriff to watch over them while Mrs. Emerson was gone. And before, well, they never lived with Mr. Sanford, but before the case, once they filed, they had protection of the court. So they were under the jurisdiction of Sheriff LeBaum. And from what I've read, he was not against their case at all. It, it's almost like certain people got it and it's like, yeah, okay. You know, but I'm going to watch over them and I'm not going to treat them poorly. And if I see an opportunity to help them, I'm going to do it under the table. So I saw that in some of my research. And um, I think that was pretty awesome. And I'm sure it was encouraging to them and their faith that, OK, maybe we will get this done because there are some good people out here wanting to help. us. And the Blow family children, as I said earlier, um, Taylor Blow, Henry Blow, Charlotte Blow, amazing people. And um, I even have a document that shows Henry Blow on the um, witness list when he testified on behalf of them Did he? and he was a very well-known wealthy and a successful man he did not have to do that and he was a witness on the stand for Dred Scott so um they, they were involved and yet at the same time they were um ribbed and you know maybe poked fun at or, or castigated for helping slaves you know that wasn't something that they could get around yeah he might have had a few neighbors uh giving them the cold shoulder at least, right? At the least, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to I have to ask you this. And uh, I don't know if you if you have any of this. But in my family, for instance, there's, there's little things little anecdotes that get passed down about certain ancestors. I had a, a great great grandfather who fought in the Union Army, he was volunteer infantry, Pennsylvania. And he went in as a drummer boy, but quickly was just thrown in thrown into the infantry. And Later on, it was passed down to me that when, when he was an older man, he was a practical joker and he used to play jokes on other people. But if they played a joke back, he didn't think it was funny. And <laughs> I, had a great uncle, <laughs> I had a great uncle who said to me once, he had his drum from the Civil War up until like the 1950s. And I said, where is it? He said, I threw it out. And I said, no. why did you throw it out? And he said to me, I didn't like him. <laughs> so wow. my point is that got passed down in our family as a kind of a little anecdote. Do you have anything that got passed down to you about your great, great grandparents? Anything at all that came through oral histories through your family? Or is that something that just wasn't there for you? You had to kind of look into the documents that were there. Well, it's not an antidote, 
but I know the phrase, Lizzie married Wilson Madison was always something I heard. And it turns out that Lizzie was not Wilson Madison's wife, but Eliza was. So all along up until 2006, people were saying that the wrong daughter was the great grandmother. Oh, okay. She was, Lizzie was the sister of Eliza. Eliza married Wilson Madison, but we found that out through the documents. Mm. Okay, the documents were there. And yet Eliza died fairly young, like about 49. And Lizzie did take care of the two surviving children that she had. The only two we knew that she had, one was my grandfather. So um, until we did that research, I had Lizzie and Wilson Madison being the people who created the great grandchildren, but it's really Eliza. So there's more to that story, but uh, that's, that's good enough for now. <laughs> yeah. History is fun, isn't it? It's like detective work and it's oh, very much story yeah. Solving puzzles. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So Lynn, have you come across any surprises in your research? Well, actually, I just told you one. <laughs> but along with that, uh, yes, we did find some more surprises. We found that, I just told you that um, one of the boys was my grandfather. So I tell people that my grandfather was Dred Scott's grandson. And that helps them line up how I fit there in the lineage. But we found out that my grandfather, John, and his brother, Harry, John and Harry Madison, they were the surviving children. And we did not know that there were four other children mm -hmm. that were born to Eliza and Wilson Madison. They all died in infantry, infancy. And we did get the records of their births and their deaths and their names. So this is bona fide, legitimate, true information. But the family did not know this. So that was a surprise. And then the other surprise was as we were looking through and found these babies' names and so forth, the lady who was um, researching this primarily was Ruth Ann Hager. She was a wonderful woman, certified genealogist who worked for the St. Louis County Library. She's now retired, but she's a dear friend. And we collaborated on a lot of this because it became the book of the Dred Scott family history. And what she found one day, she called me on the phone when I was working at Brian K. Law Firm uh, and hats off to them always forever for their support and letting me do what I needed to do while I worked there. She called and she said, Lynn, uh, I've got something to tell you. You won't believe this. And she said, there is a baby buried with Harriet. Really? And I went, what? And this was before we knew that there were other children and, and we were discovering them. And she said, yeah, the records show that her grave was open and this child was interred on a certain date and so forth. So it was like, wow, unbelievable. So then she calls me a few days later and she says, are you sitting down? I go, yeah, what now? She says, there's a baby buried with Dred. Dred Scott has another grandchild. And so as she was making her case and had the documentation, I always remember her saying, who else would you open your mother's grave for? but to put in perhaps your own child, her grandchild. Aww. And so the records do show that. And that is what we believe happened. Mm -hmm. Those are definitely interesting discoveries for certain. Lynn, I understand you've developed a friendship with the descendants of Supreme Court Justice Roger Taney, who ruled against your great great grandparents in 1857 in the Dred Scott decision. Can you tell us about how that came about? Well, that's an odd rumor, my word, yeah. <laughs> well, it's actually more than a rumor. It is totally true, I do know them. And it's a beautiful story. Um, I had always wanted to meet someone in their family because I had a program that they fit into very well, but I couldn't find them. And I always said, if I ever do find them, it's probably gonna take about a year or two to warm them up to the idea of working with me and being out there and all of that. Um, and, you know, Tawny was never liked, but you know, as the last few years, it's been really rough on him, the judge. So um, I'm, I'm just, you know, going along doing my thing. And on a week that 
was one never to forget. I had uh, two Saturdays in a row where some amazing historic things happened. But on the Wednesday between those two Saturdays, I got an email from a young lady who said, hi, my name is Kate Tawny Billingsley. And I wrote a play about Dred Scott descendant and Judge Tawny's descendant meeting over coffee. And I wonder if there's anybody out there that I can invite from the family to come and see my play. The play was in New York. When I saw that email, I just, uh, I just collapsed almost. It's like, are you kidding me? They found me. They're inviting me to New York to see a play about us, <laughs> you know, us. Uh. It's like, oh my goodness. So yes, I went and I saw this fabulous play, but I met these wonderful people. Charlie Tawney, her father, Kate, and her mother, Carol, uh, other members of the family. And the, the welcome to me was so warm. And so the play was uh, probably the first day that I got there. I think, let's say it was on a Thursday and Friday. So I, I got there on Thursday and uh, she picked me up, uh, brought me to where her dad was and we all went and had a meal. And we chatted and they were just fabulously gracious and excited that I was there. And so uh, we prepared for the play that night. Uh, there was a talk back session, but I didn't do the first night because I thought I should wait and see the play <laughs> to be just to be sure. I don't have to say something I don't mean or say something mean. I wouldn't do that. But anyway, play was phenomenally awesome because the two descendants had not met. And I won't go into the whole play, but the but the um, conversation was powerful and the words were, were there. And there was this conversation that had to be had. And this beautiful 31 year old white girl put words in Dred Scott's descendant that just blew the audience away. And so the play itself was an icebreaker, if you will, within the relationship, which wasn't cold, but I mean, it, it just, it was there. It was like, oh, they get it. They really do get it. And so uh, the second night uh, the play was done again at the actor's studio, I might add. And I was on the talk back session then, and it was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful trip. And we have um, since talked and worked together and continue to do that. Kate has been to St. Louis for some programs we did for a judicial college. And her dad and I have been to several cities and done uh, our, our talk in Virginia and um, Oklahoma and Annapolis. So one of the most important things that happened in our relationship is that Charlie offered an apology for the Dred Scott decision from him and his family. It was not solicited. It wasn't required. And he said he could do it or not. He was open to it, but he did choose to do that. And on March 6th of 2017, the 160th anniversary in front of the statue of his ancestor, Justice Tawney, he offered that apology. And it was uh, received uh, by myself. It was in over 200 newspapers in the country, but it was honest and pure. I, I couldn't have accepted it unless I knew their hearts. You know, you mentioned, Lynn, about the play about the descendants of Chief Justice Tawney and Dred Scott's descendants having coffee. I I'm going to come up with another situation. This is hypothetical. If you could today sit down and have a conversation for an hour, say, over a cup of tea or coffee with Dredd and or Harriet, what would you ask them? Well, there is one thing that I want to know. We talked earlier about how important it was for them to save their daughters from a life of slavery. And little known to even the family, uh, most of us, Dred and Harriet hid those girls away for a period of time. It could have been a year, it could have been two years, but they put them out of harm's way and out of sight. And my question to them is, where did you hide those girls? Because no one knows. And yet, Dred says in that Frank Leslie Illustrated that he could call them back anytime, you know, in a short, like, like now. I could get them back in a few minutes if I wanted to, which I love because... It's like, I've hidden them right under your nose, <laughs> but, but we don't know where. Now, I'll be honest with you. I do not know, but I think I'm on to something. And I think I might know where they hid the girls. I really do. And um, I need to get on that because all I can do is postulate, but I've got a lot of good 
circumstantial evidence and logic on my side. And I would like to follow up on that. I'll probably say it one day, but for now I have to hold that ace card because I don't know. And yet that would be the question I would ask them if we were having coffee together. Yeah, I would. Oh, that is cool. I can't wait to hear what your suspicions are as far as where they were hidden. I would, I, I'm really waiting with bated breath. Yeah, me too, honestly, because I want to talk about it. I really do. But I'm one of those cautious people that want to get all my ducks in a row. And so um, I don't want somebody to come behind me and shoot it down because I missed something. So I think, um, you know, maybe, well, you know, COVID hit. So I think maybe this coming year, I'll dig into it a little more. Maybe I'll put it out there. We'll see. Well, all the best to you on that research. Now, the foundation has been around for 15 years since 2006. Yeah. How has your work and the foundation in general impacted who you are today, Lynn? Wow. Well, I have always loved working. I don't mind a little work, but it has totally sort of taken over. <laughs> I also um, have always been uh, active as a volunteer, as a leader, um, manager on my jobs. Uh, I love to work with people. So, um, you know, I've always been like out there. It's impacted me in that I still get to do that, but I get to do it and talk about some really important people in my life, as well as educate people and open their eyes to truths and realities that they don't think about or hear about. And so I think what it's actually done is it's kind of put me on the front lines of, um, of sharing and teaching and meeting wonderful people and having opportunities to be in places like the Attorney General's Conference or a symposium at Harvard or something like that, or, or the Brookings Institute. I mean, these are places that I probably wouldn't have been had it not been for the story and the truth and the history that not only that we are uh, recounting, but the history that we're making. So uh, it has totally been a blessing and I will do it as long as I physically can. Mm -hmm. Well, you're a very gifted person. You're, you, you're a good storyteller. You've got a passion for what you're doing and just the stories about reconciling with the family of Justice Tawny. I mean, that's mm -hmm. part of the mission of your foundation, right? Is to uh, commemorate, educate mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. reconcile. I think mm -hmm. that's that's a wonderful thing. And I really hope there's going to be such a, a great future for your foundation as time goes by. And I hope mm -hmm. you're able to pull together more people and staff mm -hmm. to accomplish some of your goals. I understand the foundation is working on a new memorial for Dred Scott. Can you tell mm -hmm. us about that? Yes, thank you. I sure would love to. Um, we actually, uh, like I said earlier, one of the descendants of the Blow family purchased the headstone that's at Calvary right now. And it was installed in 1957. Uh, a Jesuit priest by the name of Father Edward Dowling found Dred Scott's plot numbers down in the basement there. And he said, wow, Dred Scott is buried in Calvary Cemetery. So that opened up a whole another vista of talking about Dred Scott. And yet, at the 100th anniversary, there was a ceremony and Mrs. Harrison from Pennsylvania purchased this headstone, which stands about 28 by 24. And um, it's humble, as Father Dowling said. And he said, here's a humble headstone. He said, however, if anyone one day ever wants to do more, at least they know where he lies. Mm -hmm. And so I'm in a picture where he's showing the site to my parents with a cane, okay, just pointing to the ground. Mm -hmm. And my brother and I are standing with my parents and it's, we have on coats, it's wintertime. And yet this picture was wonderful. It was in Ebony Magazine. And so there's the spot. All right, so the headstone went there. And now here we are almost, um, my goodness, 67, 60 some years later, 65. I am trying to get a memorial monument to put there and replace the one that's been there since 57 because it's humble. <laughs> it's hard to find. And it doesn't say much and it's not much to see. 
in Calvary, which is an amazing cemetery, the headstones and, and monuments are just all over the place. And Dred Stone, Dred Scott has a small, humble stone, which I am most grateful for. I wanted to be sure that that's understood. I am so thankful that they did this and we have loved this all these years. But we are now in a day and time when people who go there, and he, by the way, is one of the top three people who are ever asked for when they come to Calvary from all over the world. Where's Dred Scott? And then when they do get there, there's not that much to see. So our foundation is trying to raise enough money to purchase the one that we have designed, which will be very, very beautiful. And his image will be on it. There will be ample space to tell the history. It will be in uh, black granite and nine feet high with a base 10 by 10. So the monument that we are creating for him is on three plots because Taylor Blow had to buy three plots because a black person could be buried next to a white person. Wow. However, today, this enables me to use the whole space to create this new monument. And we have a GoFundMe campaign as well as people have just donated, you know, all kinds of ways so that we can uh, hopefully raise the money that we need to get this done. And um, I would love to see it in next September. Not sure we're gonna make that goal, but perhaps we'll see. But that is one of, uh, one of our major programs right now is to get his monument in. Terrific. Tell us how, how can people find out more about that and contributing toward that, Lynn? Well, they can contribute by going to our website, which is dreadscottlives.org. There is a story there. It's not at the top anymore. I looked at it last night, but we'll put it back up. And then the gofundme.com and put in Dred Scott and it'll come up and they'll be able to see a little history that I wrote there and a picture of what I just showed you. Uh, I told you rather a picture of us at the grave site with Dot, Father Dowling. Oh, great. Are there any other projects that you're working on now that are uh, big projects? Well, yeah, there are a few, but I'll tell you one that I really think is cool. It's called Reading a Civil Right. And there are two components to it. Uh, one is to teach people how to read and the other is family literacy where we have book giveaways and programs where we teach families how to read together and work together and have fun together and different aspects of literacy. So uh, we do have a space at Chesterfield Mall in St. Louis, West County, and it is called the Dred Scott Office Center, but it's large enough to have workshops and exhibits there. Other programs we have planned for 2022 include exhibits such as an art exhibit on the faces of Dred Scott, We'll have one on Annie Malone, who was a local black entrepreneur here in St. Louis, but nationwide, she impacted everyone, as well as we will have an exhibit on the Negro Baseball League here because their 100th anniversary was the other year. And I have another ancestor who's famous in that league. So it's another story for another time. I'll be back on your show. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear it. I want to have you back on the show again. And perhaps, yeah. Yeah, Lynn, this has been a tremendous interview. I am I am so thankful that I've been able to meet you and hear about all the great stuff that your family is doing, the you know, the spirit of bringing history alive, you know, educating people, you know, creating memorials so when people come to visit they go they go out and uh, our family used to go out on history vacations where we would go to different mm -hmm. landmarks. Um, people yeah. going into into the St. Louis area and saying Hey, where's, you know, where's Dred Scott buried? And then there'll be, you know, think of a monument there and the, the history behind it. And people will want to know more about it. I think what you're doing is amazing. And the heart of reconciliation mm -hmm. is just, it's just so wonderful to hear. Just one last time. Could you, could you give our listeners the name of your website in case they want to come uh, go online and find more information about you and your organization? Definitely. Thank you. Yes, we are at Dred Scott Lives, L I B E S, dredscottlives.org. We have an older website, the Dred Scott Foundation.org. We do not keep that one up, but it has a lot of information, wonderful history, and background on what we've done over the last, well, from 20, uh, 2007 to 2017. And then the new one, Dred Scott Lives, picked up in 2017, and we keep that one as current as possible. And so uh, that, and then GoFundMe.com if people want to donate to the memorial or read about it and donate. And so um, we'd appreciate that. Where our email is info at 
the Dred Scott Foundation.org if they want to contact me. I also do speaking engagements and would love to uh, come out and share this story in detail, which, you know, we skated across a lot of good things here, but there's more to the story than we can get in this detail here. Oh, definitely. Lynn, I thank you for all you do. And I urge our listeners to contribute to the memorial and really look into all the things that uh, you and the foundation are involved in. James, thank you so much for this opportunity. It was a pleasure to meet you as well. Thank you. Thank you. And, and have a great day and God bless. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So for all of our listeners, keep discovering and telling stories that inspire you and others. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. You can connect with us on Facebook and YouTube at Your History, Your Story, or on Instagram and Twitter at YHYS Podcast. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.